For tonight's feature on The Last Late Show, we'll take a look at the solo directorial debut of then-fledgling director Catherine Bigelow, who gambled her career on a three minutes to midnight Faustian bargain that see her lay the groundwork for a film she'd written, but may not get to direct, as Murphy's Law would unleash a maelstrom of disasters that seemed tailor-made to undo all her efforts. Instead, the film will go on to become a phenomenal cult classic and a cornerstone, the interpretation reimagining of the modern vampire. That's right, tonight we're talking about 1987's Near Dark. We're going to cover it all, from snowstorms to floods to freezing weather, to the producer that fell asleep at the wheel, nearly killing them both, and a fit of method acting madness on a lonely stretch of Arizona road that nearly cost the life of a vampire lead. Yep, you are not going to want to miss this, because you're going to hear it here only tonight and only on The Last Late Show. You're tuned to The Last Late Show, where we tour the back lot of some of the greatest horror and sci-fi films in cinematic history. Bringing more than just reviews, we bring you the story behind the story. A backstage pass into the spills behind the chills and the teams behind the screams. I'm your host, Jonathan Rain. Howdy. My name's Homer. What's yours? Sarah, what are you doing down here all by yourself? I do what I want to do when I want to do it. Want to watch TV? What's on? Whatever you want. Is it a cloud television? Released October 2nd, 1987, literally in the shadow of the Lost Boys, Near Dark will gross just $635,000 its opening weekend and $3.4 million during its entire theatrical run on a production budget of $5 million. Now, despite the financial loss, Bigelow's raw talent and calculated approach would catch Hollywood's attention with her tale of a nuclear family of Dust Bowl vampires that eke out a meager existence across the plains of middle America. You know we got a clip. Roll em. Well, I sort of saw it as, as families fighting to remain intact. You know, they fight for him and um, fathers fighting for sons. And... And also wanting to um, look at these characters who, are, who I sort of see as modern day gunslingers as feeders as opposed to killers. They're not psychopathic killers killing for the sake of killing. They're victims of a violent act themselves. They didn't ask to become who and what they are. So in that context, um, that nuclear structure, I mean, they're sort of like a pack of wolves, you know, trying to survive and will survive so long as the family unit stays intact. When that implodes, you have anarchy, and and that's what um, ultimately is their undoing. So in a way, it's a very it's very much of a cautionary tale, pleading for the nuclear family. Now it comes a little surprise that critics would give Near Dark such a lukewarm reception, given the genre. We know how that goes. We've been down that road here at the Last Late Show, and her directing style, which one critic would refer to as the scattershot school of filmmaking. We'll cover that a little later from the Washington Post and the New York Times. But for right now, let's jump over into some cinematic accolades. Now, Near Dark would garner one win and nine nominations. The win coming in 1988 from the Brussels International Festival of Fantasy Film, where Bigelow would take home the Silver Raven Award. Boy, that sounds like a superhero or something, doesn't it? The Silver Raven. Uh, the bulk of the nominations would actually come from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. In 1988, where Bigelow would also be nominated for Saturn Award for Best Director. In addition, Paxton would be nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Joshua John Miller, who played Homer, would be nominated for Best Performance by a Younger Actor. Near Dark would be nominated overall for Saturn Award as Best Horror Film of the Year. Do you see? Someone was paying attention. And Jeanette Goldstein would also be nominated for Best Supporting Actress. Now we do have another organization here, the Young Artists Awards, I am not familiar with them. Marcy Leeds, who played Caleb's younger sister, will be nominated for Best Young Actress in a Horror or Mystery Motion Picture. Boy, they just keep inventing these groups and categories, don't they? And Joshua John Miller would also be nominated on top of that for, get this, Teenage Favorite in a Horror or Drama Motion Picture. Now, there's one more here. There's the Aviarez Fantastic Film Festival. Forgive me if I mispronounce that. 
Catherine Bigelow would be nominated for their grand prize and does not say here what that grand prize was. But isn't it just nice to be nominated for a grand prize? Isn't it just nice? Even if they don't tell you what the grand prize is, it's just nice to be nominated. So there you go. All of those wins and nominations would come between 88 and 89. There you go. Catherine would take home that silver raven. Boy, I'd like to see a picture of what that looks like. Now, Bigelow would begin her career as a painter, believe it or not. A very talented painter, apparently. And she spent two years at San Francisco Art Institute. I'm sure you guys all remember the Art Institute. They used to advertise somewhere between uh, Gomer Pyle, <laughs> Mayberry RFD, somewhere between uh, about, uh, 12, about 12 p.m. to maybe about uh, 2 30 in the afternoon. And she went from the Art Institute all the way to an Oscar. So there's hope. All right, so a very talented painter, Catherine would spend two years at San Francisco Art Institute. At 20, she'd win a scholarship to the Whitney Museum's Independent Study Program. Now, we did learn that Catherine used to have a studio, as a matter of fact, in an old bank vault and dilapidated building, an off-track betting place, okay? An abandoned building, and uh, just imagine painting down there at 3 a.m. But, uh, yeah, that's where her studio was located, in an old bank vault. Because you needed a bank vault and an off-track betting place. I mean, you know, people like to gamble and uh, I'm sure they laid down some pretty heavy wagers. But anyway, the bank vault was still there, even though the place was out of business and the building was abandoned. And that's where Bigelow took up uh, residence and uh, she painted there. Now, later, she'd earn a scholarship to study film at Columbia University, graduating in 1979. I personally had to be somewhere around, oh, eight years old during that time. Now, Catherine has a famous personal quote. And it goes like this. If there is specific resistance to women making movies, I choose to ignore that as an obstacle for two reasons. I can't change my gender, and I refuse to stop making movies. It's irrelevant who or what directed a movie. The important thing is that you either respond to it or you don't. There should be more women directing. I think there's just not the awareness that's really possible. It is. And we'll see, uh, Catherine was a absolute trailblazer, obviously. That quote had to be at least over 30 years old. But, uh, I mean, we have what? I believe tons of female directors. I think the entire She-Hulk series on Disney, I believe it's all female directors, right? Female writers, I know. And I believe they have a female director on She-Hulk. Yeah. So a lot, she, she was a trailblazer. And the, uh, the field now is loaded with female directors. Uh, way to go, Catherine. Now, in 2009, uh, Harvard would uh, host a retrospective of her career, the uh, Harvard Film Archive, and it was titled Take It to the Edge, the Films of Catherine Bigelow. Now, it would showcase all of her work from The Loveless in 81 to The Hurt Locker in 2008. How about that? And it would feature a live Q&A session with her. Has anyone actually seen Catherine Bigelow in person? Because I'd swear that Bigelow, and there was an 80s singer that uh, passed away in 2004 named Laura Branigan. You guys remember Branigan? Yeah, exactly. She did songs like Gloria and my personal favorite, uh, Self Control. Yeah, there you go. And uh, yeah, I'd swear those two could have been sisters. So yeah, that's something. Anyway, now the Hurt Locker actually, uh, with the Hurt Locker, uh, Catherine became the first woman to win the Academy Award for Best Director. That's right. She took home an Oscar for the Hurt Locker. Now, I remember the Hurt Locker for two reasons, because one, during her speech, Catherine made no mention of the fact that she was the first woman to take home the Oscar for Best Directing. How about that? And two, Hurt Locker became one of the most illegally downloaded movies in movie history, I believe, earning a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records. And the MPAA sent out love letters along with trackers and those copies of the Hurt Locker that they seeded on sites such as uh, Napster, LimeWire, FrostWire, Minova, Kaza, Pirate Bay. Uh, during the downloading frenzy, they waited about two weeks and then decided to let the public at large know that they had uh, put a lot of copies out there with trackers in there and they would be personally paying a visit to the individuals who illegally downloaded the Hurt Locker. I've never been so glad in my life that I was not a fan of war movies. Now, Catherine would also win Directors Guild of America Award for Outstanding Directing, BAFTA Award for Best Director, and she also became the first woman to win the Saturn Award for Best Director in 1995 for Strange Days, starring Angela Bassett. Wow. 
Catherine was definitely on fire that entire decade. Trail Blazer, you women should be proud. There you go. Now, our favorite films A Wild Bunch in 69, Mean Streets in 73, Lawrence of Arabia in 1962, The Terminator in 1984 by ex husband James Cameron, and various collective works of Alfred Hitchcock. I can personally agree with that owning over 20 of Hitchcock's books and uh, used to love that uh, that Hitchcock series that used to come on TV, uh, Hitchcock Presents. They put that on in the middle of the night, somewhere between, I think, 11.30 and 12 at night. I'd watch that all the time. Now, Near Dark would be Catherine's first solo directing effort. For then, she co-directed The Loveless with Monty Montgomery, starring Willem Dafoe, a tale in which a motorcycle gang on their way to the races in Daytona Stops over in a small southern town and trouble ensues. I'm sure that's a very interesting tale, though I've never seen it. And trouble would ensue. As you can imagine, it would when a motorcycle gang stops over in a small southern town. Uh, <laughs> that's a recipe for disaster right there. I mean, there, there's just there's so many things that could go wrong with that situation. And apparently did because they made a movie out of it. Well, Near Dark was co-written with Eric Red. I'm sure you horror aficionados out there. Eric Red needs no introduction. You want to know what happens to an eyeball when it gets punctured? That's right. We're talking about Eric Red of The Hitcher, starring Rutger Hauer, C. Thomas Howell, and Jennifer Jason Leigh. Now, the creation of Near Dark would come as a two-piece. Eric Red and Catherine Bigelow would get together and decide to write two screenplays on spec, one being Undertow, the other being Near Dark. The Undertow would star Lou Diamond Phillips, I have to admit, I've never seen that movie, though Lou Diamond Phillips is one of my favorite 80s actors from such classics as Young Guns 1 and 2 and a 1990s supernatural thriller starring Jeff Cover and Tracy Griffiths. Anyone? That's right, The First Power. We will be covering that at some point with that awesome cliffhanger ending. Now, films like The Hitcher and The First Power are Friday night staples at any video store. Any of us growing up in the 80s and 90s know those movies constantly ended up in our little basket, along with snow caps, scoobers, and that microwave popcorn <laughs> on our way to the counter for a wonderful weekend. Boy, I miss that. Last video store I know is out in Bend, Oregon. There's the last blockbuster in the world out there. We actually took a trip out there. Not as the last late show, but we did go out there. We got some shirts. And I know they were doing a podcast out there, or a video, a YouTube podcast. They might still have it. You can check it out. It's the last blockbuster. And uh, another thing I saw at one point, they had turned it into an Airbnb where you could get this, spend the night in the blockbuster. They sort of set it up like an 80s living room. And uh, yeah, you had pretty much the run of the store for the evening. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you had pretty much run the store for the evening. You could go around, get movies, you know, watch films, crash on the couch, you know, eat microwave popcorn. Might be something to check out if you're in the area. Uh, from where we're at, Bend, Oregon is quite a drive. But uh, getting out there and seeing the last blockbuster is worth it. So there's something for you to do. Now, Catherine and Eric would get together. They would write two films on spec. Like I said, one was Undertow, the other was Near Dark. And they'd begin to shop Near Dark around looking for financing. Now, Near Dark would come across the desk of executive producer Ed Feldman, who loved the script. He loved the idea. What he wasn't in love with was the fact that Catherine had such limited experience directing. And most and most definitely directing a film of such magnitude like Near Dark. Now, you have to understand something. We're going to just take a sidebar here for a minute. As an executive producer, producer, or even director, you know, you get into the habit of being able to read scripts. You can read scripts, you can look at these stunts, the shots, as things are described, and what you're seeing, or perhaps the shooting locations, the things that are going to take place in these scripts. You can get an idea of not only their difficulty in directing and staying on time, on budget, but also the ability to pull these things off, and you can pretty much put a dollar amount around that. And that's when experience uh, 